I'm going to talk to you today about how a landlord with a long-term view approaches a retrofit program. So uh, that landlord is Grosvenor, and I lead the refurbishment of the London estate, and I also sponsor our 10-year retrofit program. So today I'm going to briefly share with you a perspective on Grosvenor, our energy efficiency program, our goals and some of the lessons we've learned to date. And I'll touch on those two case studies in my intro, which were the first NFIT passive house in the UK private rental sector, and also the first listed building to achieve an outstanding design stage from Briam. Of course, Grosvenor is more than just a landlord. So I work for the UK business, which is Grosvenor, Britain and Ireland, and that's part of the Grosvenor Group. And we're active in 60 cities across 17 countries. And Grosvenor is a private company with a 300-year history rooted in our historic estates in Mayfair and Belgravia. So our objective is to generate long-term and growing income from recurring sources. And our strategy is to create and maintain sustainable urban neighbourhoods across the country that are great places for people to work in, visit and live. So we focus on the importance of place rather than the individual buildings to the people that live there. So we have skills as master planners, developers, asset managers, landlords, public sector partners, and we avoid a one-size-fits-all approach. So in Britain and Ireland, we have a diverse uh, portfolio focused on the London estate, which I'm going to be focusing today, and we have developments elsewhere in Edinburgh, Liverpool, Oxford, Cambridge, and Southampton. And we have uh, £5.7 billion worth of assets under management. So our challenge, uh, our London estate... Um, I'll just orientate you there. So our, our Mayfair estate in that tiny top red blob there, that's bounded to the north by Oxford Street and then to the west by Hyde Park. And then the lower red blob is Belgravia and that's bounded to the east by Buckingham Palace and by the south by Victoria Station. So we have quite a, quite a sizable challenge to be uh, approaching. Grosvenor has been around for 300 years, so we plan to be a, around for another few hundred. And during that time, the London State has seen and adapted to continual change. And as a global city that continues to change, we'll have to always respond to that change. By being more active, more open, more integrated, with better streets, greener spaces, and enterprising places that appeal to the many, and of course, by being resilient. And energy efficiency is going to be a key plank of that resilience. Energy efficiency is, of course, good for our occupiers. It brings savings and it supports well-being. And therefore, over time, it will be good for our business. So what's our plan? Uh, in simple terms, we have a 10-year plan to reduce carbon by 50%. So we aim to do that for our directly man managed properties by 2023 and across our whole portfolio by 2030. So we fully accept that's an extremely ambitious target, but we are aware that we've, we've got to aim high if we're going to play our part to support the UK's target to reduce emissions by 80% Sorry, by 2050. So how are we going to deliver that? So we're focused on three phases. The first, which was the very important phase, was to ensure that no one on our estate was at risk of fuel poverty. So we have lots of um, elderly, vulnerable occupiers and persuading them to let us enter into their properties and carry out energy efficiency was extremely challenging. But we were successful and they're now all benefiting from comfortable homes and low energy bills. So by starting with the affordable housing, not only was it the right thing to do, it also gave us great insight into what works well and what doesn't work so well for the next phase. 
So the second phase, which is going to take us all the way up to 2023, is um, embedding our energy efficiency into our existing plan maintenance and refurbishment pipeline. So essentially, every time we touch one of our properties, we take the opportunity to improve the energy efficiency. And we do that with a trusted framework team of consultants and contractors. Uh, and I believe that's one of our key, key reasons why we're successful, having that trusted framework team. So that team understands our heritage buildings and they work collaboratively. So they can overcome the obvious challenges and nuances that heritage buildings bring up all the time. And our last phase is the third phase, is engaging with our long leaseholders to persuade them to carry out energy efficiency works at the same time they're doing their own refurbishments. So that's going to be obviously extremely challenging, persuading other people to spend their money to do something. So we've come up with an online guide which shows simple solutions using our own estate as case studies that can make a difference and we're going to provide uh, advice targeted to their properties to make it as easy as possible for them to incorporate that into their works. So uh, how do we measure performance? Well, we, we've had this KPI, which is how much it costs us to save a tonne of carbon. So at the moment, it's costing us £11.50, which is pretty good, but we're constantly looking at that, monitoring it, and trying to get more efficient. And we also determine our energy efficiency measures by using a MAC curve, which is a marginal abatement cost curve, and that's an example of one. So essentially, uh, this ranks carbon reduction against cost. So the width of the column is equal to the amount of carbon saved, and the area is equal to the cost or benefit. So essentially, if you only wanted to do measures that's going to save you money, you would start on the left-hand side and you'd work your way up. And you wouldn't go above the line unless you're really interested in saving a lot of carbon. So we, we only pick measures that are above the line if we're doing like a research project or really trying to push the boundaries. So on to some case studies now. Uh, this is uh, a mid two mid-terrace properties on Parsmore Street that were constructed in the mid-1800s. So these properties were the first in the UK to get the NFIT passive house standard in the private rented sector. So they actually perform 83% better than the adjoining terrace, even though that adjoining terrace we also did a light refurbishment on. So uh, for those who don't know, NFIT passive house uh, means that the buildings have to have an air tightness of less than one air changes per hour which means they feel very comfortable and require virtually no heating. Because of the air tightness, they have mechanical heat recovery systems which circulate and filter the air, providing fantastic air quality. So this project was finished in January 2015 and occupied a month later. And like all of our retrofit projects, we're closely monitoring to ensure that it performs as we planned. So to date, it's reassuringly close to what we predicted, but as everything is room for improvement, we're, we're working now to think about how we can go back to the occupiers and uh, persuade them to change on their behaviours to get even better performance out of the unit. So, oops, sorry. So the next case study is um, 119 Ebury Street, which we're extremely proud of and has recently just finished. So this is the first listed building to achieve BRIAM outstanding at design stage. Again, it's a, uh, a mid-terrace constructed in the 1800s. And the objective of this project was to challenge the view that listed buildings can't achieve the high levels of energy efficiency required to support the 2050 80% reduction target. So this project, 119 Ebury Street, has achieved over that 80% reduction, which is a fantastic result and testament to many years of design and redesign and lengthy planning negotiations. But as part of our commitment to understand the impact on listed buildings, we're going to be carrying out a two-year performance monitoring comparing our base case of 125 Ebury Street. And we're going to share those reports quarterly with Westminster Council and Heritage England. So in that, we're going to be monitoring energy, temperature, water use, and then we're going to overlay occupier interviews so that we ensure that the occupier behaviour is taken into account. 
So what have we achieved so far? So we're three years into our tenure program, and we've saved 1,700 tonnes of carbon, which, just to put that in perspective, is the equivalent of planting trees in areas 45 times the size of Hyde Park, or you can drive around the world 200 times. So it's, it's a substantial difference already, and that's just three years in. <clears throat> so what have we learnt about how to deliver a successful large-scale retrofit program? So firstly, and most importantly, you have to remember that this is actually fundamentally a program of works and a change project. So, you know, you could have a whole conference on leading change, but, you know, creating vision, building trust, embedding goals, all those things are fundamental to, to delivering this. Uh, consistent and collaborative teams. If you don't work with the same people, how are you going to learn your mistakes? And you're always going to come across challenges, so if you don't work collaboratively, those challenges will just become arguments and the projects will just stall. The end user has so much impact on how the building performs, it's vital to find a way to communicate with them to how to get the best out of their building. And if you don't think about how the building is going to be maintained, then the performance will again ultimately suffer. So you've got mechanical ventilation, heat recovery systems, you need to change the filter every six months. So will you ask the tenant to do it, or will you send it a contractor to do it? So designers, you want to be pushing an open door. So there's a difference between designing sustainably, because that's what the clients asked you to do, and genuinely believing in it. So those that are just following the client's brief, they tend to retrofit sustainability into their designs, and inevitably, you end up with a compromised product. What you actually need is those who are naturally thinking about resource efficiency before they come up with concepts, so the design is better in the end, more than you expected, and, and it tends to cost less. Data. So there's so much data involved in running a retrofit program. We have buildings that are sending back data every five minutes to us, and we've got a huge amount of data to sort through. So we need to have someone to help us interpret what that data means. And getting the data is really not easy at all. So you've got to, we've got lots of properties that have basements, that have very poor, poor signal. You know, we've got to get access to those properties, persuade people to let us in, and then the tenants go and turn the monitoring equipment off. It's really complex. Um, innovative products is not for everybody. It's extremely risky and inevitably, there's going to be limited information available to you on those products. So you need to be able to understand the risk of what those will do and know when to go ahead and when not to go ahead. And lastly, you need to find a way to be able to determine the right measures without spending too much time and too much money on consultants, which means ideally training up your own internal surveyors and pro project managers who know your buildings. So uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation, and I will leave you with a relaxing photo of Grosvenor Square. So we're holding some community events there at the moment. So everyone in the area, pop along. Thank you very much.